The Spirit of God is moving so strong, you just, you don't want it to stop. Amen? Amen. I don't know. I can't think of anything else that I'd rather do than have a night like tonight in His presence. Amen? Amen. And in this move of God, in what, what God is doing, He is calling us to a higher level in our relationship with him, both individually and corporately. You say, what what does that look like? God is calling us to not just be a place where we invite him to come down, but he's inviting us to come up to where he is. He's calling us to go into that holy place, into... The, the chambers of the king. And while we absolutely love and expect for the Holy Spirit to come down to where we are, but God's saying, but, but the greatest things are the ones that you'll find when you seek me and come up to where I am. Hmm. Through the work of the cross and the power of his resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection, we have been given a way to the Father. We've been given a way to go into that secret place, into that holy place. And God is ready, and He's willing. And He's not just invited, but He desires for us to come up to where He is and to be where He is. And to live in that place. In the book of Psalms, David says that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And in another portion of Scripture, it says that God, the high and lofty one whose name, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy, he says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is of a contrite heart, or humble heart and contrite spirit, and a pure in heart. And so tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about God's drawing and his beckoning for us, both individually and corporately, to come and to rise into a new level in the spirit. And I'll tell you, with having nights like this, it's pretty hard not to. (laughs) Amen. Amen. But where this will be maximized and where you will find this take a whole new form and go to a whole new level of effectiveness is when you take the level of focus and pursuit of God that you have here and you take it home with you. Because I'll tell you what, what you're seeing here is simply the fruit of a seed that was sown previously. If it weren't for time spent in prayer, I I walked by our intercessors who are upstairs before the service tonight. Man, what a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to have people who will, it, where no one's looking or no one sees, just intercede for the move of God and nobody knows their names. Nobody knows who, nobody knows how much of an impact they really have. But God knows, amen? But I was walking by and and there were, I just could feel the spirit of God and that spirit of intercession, intercession moving so powerfully. And I remember thinking to myself, said, most, people, most people don't know how much they are plowing in the spirit when they're doing that. They're plowing in the spirit. And that was really, that was the mental picture I had is that the, literally their prayers were like a plow into soil. And they were just tilling that soil and, and churning it up to, so that the nutrients would be on the top and so the soil would be healthy. So then when Pastor Steve plants the seeds of the word or the seeds that have already been planted, those will flourish and they'll blossom. The move of the Spirit will flourish and it'll blossom. But what we see here in the services is simply a fruit of something that's been sown already. This is not, this, the meetings that we're having here do not come except someone has prayed a price. Except someone has sought God. Except someone has 
lived a life of consecration and dedication and focus upon him, who set their eyes like a flint and says, I'm not going to accept anything less than the fullness of God's glory manifested in my life. I will not accept anything less than the, re- the manifestation of the promise of greater works. And I love what, what Boren said in the class th- that we had this morning with the, with the staff and, and s- the interns. The greater works, it has, that promise is yet to be fulfilled. We've yet to see the full manifestation of what God wants to do. And I'll tell you what, if there's anything, if there's anything that I thank God for about this church, it's that we're not willing to settle. That we're hungry enough, that we're willing to lay everything else aside for the greater works, for the greater things. But us going up to where he is costs us more than simply him just coming to where we are. Which is why so often people grow complacent and they, they just grow, they just, they're, they're happy where they're at. They're saying, well, we're just going to pitch tent here. We've gone high enough up the mountain of the glory. We've seen enough of Jesus. We, we're just pitch tent here and we'll just hang out here. But the Lord dropped something in my spirit a week or so ago. And he said, in order to go into an extraordinary place, you, can't, you will not get there with ordinary thinking. You cannot get to an extraordinary place with ordinary thinking. You have to have extraordinary thinking. You have to have the mind of Christ. And that mind of Christ, part of that mind of Christ is a, a, a being adamant about not settling. I will not settle. I love what Pastor Steve says that the the essence of a poverty spirit is willing to accept less than God's absolute best for our lives. So often we have such a spiritual poverty spirit. We're willing to accept spiritual poverty. Willing to accept just, oh man, this is nice, this is good, I've had enough. And God said, no. How can you have enough of an, inti- of an infinite, infinite God? A God who is not holding anything back. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to open your Bibles to John chapter 17. It's a familiar portion of Scripture for the Upper Room Church, and it's part of the core of who we are. In this, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before he gets taken away to be crucified. And in this prayer, when, when Jesus is praying for his disciples and he's praying for us, it's interesting, there's three sections of this prayer and we're just going to go over two of them tonight the last two but the first section the first thing that Jesus prays for his disciples is he prays for their purity he prays that by the washing of the water of the word he says sanctify them by thy truth your word is truth and he says father I don't desire that you just take them out of the world but I desire that you keep them from the evil one The second thing that Jesus prays for is he prays for unity. He prays that, I'm sorry, not for you, he prays for the glory. He says, Father, the glory that you've given me, I want to give it to them. And then the third thing that he prays is he prays for unity. When he says, Father, I desire that they may be with me where I am. And I believe that in this passage of Scripture, we see a process that God wants to take us through, to take us up to where He is, to live and to dwell where He is. Let's look at this. We're going to talk about just those last two tonight. Beginning with verse 20, John chapter 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory, someone say the glory. glory. The glory which you have given me, I have given them. Notice here he didn't say, I'm going to give them when they behave themselves for long enough. He didn't say, I'm going to give them when they, they fast for a certain number of days. 
And praise God for fasting. We need to do that. Amen. Amen. Praise God for our obedience. We need to do that. Amen. Amen. But one of the greatest lies that the enemy has been able to sow into so many of our hearts and minds is that we think that somehow that the promises of God, where he says, I have given it, that, but it means, but it doesn't really mean he has given it. We think it's, it's something that's going to be given. So we keep asking God for something which he's already given. Instead, God is asking us to do that which is required for receiving that which has already been given. Pastor Steve uh, sometimes does a, an illustration where he'll bring up a young person and take out a $20 bill and say, I hereby right now in front of everyone, I give you this $20 bill. And, you know, everyone applauds. Oh, isn't that so nice? And, but he's holding it in his hand. And he asks, says, so are you, are you enjoying your money? Oftentimes people say yes, and I just think that's kind of funny. They're enjoying their money and they don't have it. I don't enjoy money that I don't have personally. I enjoy money that's in the bank, that's, that's there. <laughs> but, but then he'll ask the congregation, he'll say, well, have I given it to them? So yes, I, I've, I've given them, I've given this person this $20 bill, but they have not received it yet. Because I place a condition, I place a demand, you've got to come take it. Because God will chase you to the ends of the earth to get you out of hell. But he will only invite you into the secret place. He will only invite you into the holy of holies. Because intimacy can only be invited, it can't be forced. Intimacy can't be forced upon someone. Of any kind. Unless you pursue it, it's illegitimate. And God has already pursued us. And now, in turn, he's turning to us and say, pursue me. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. He said, ask, and then you'll receive. You seek, and then you find. God wants us to initiate. He has already initiated, but now he wants us to initiate in return. He wants us to respond to the relationship that he initiated on the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wants us to respond. Hmm. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, verse 22, that they may be one just as we are one. In this one verse right here, we find the, the vision statement for why Jesus came to the planet. It was for the purpose of us being up where he is. The reason why Jesus came and died on the cross, the reason why he forgave us of our sins the reason why he plucked us out of hell and gave us an open door into heaven there was one purpose in mind he wanted to unify us in himself he wanted to bring us to take us up to where he is in the spirit when adam and eve were in the garden they were walking with god they were talking with god they have a level they had a level of unity with god that man has not since had since the fall of man until the cross for thousands of years after the sin of man there was a separation from god there was a a unity that was lost because put it in your spirit the closer and closer you get to god the easier it is to grieve the spirit and put a wedge in your relationship Just like it's a whole lot easier for someone to really hurt your feelings when you're very, very close to them than it is a complete stranger. God has just as much capacity to hurt as we do. God does not grow bitter and he does not grow cold in his love. Not for one moment. But he does have the capacity to hurt. His heart hurts for the lost. What do you think Jesus was feeling in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed and he was interceding and he was sweating blood? I do not believe that he was so anticipating the pain of the cross that that was why he was sweating blood. 
I believe that it was, he has such a tender heart burning with desire for us. That before the foundations of the world were laid, he knew you. And he loved you. I love what Pastor Al said recently. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said, you're my dream come true. Can you believe that? Can we have the faith to believe that the God who created the universe with a word dreamed about us? He dreamed about you. And you entering into relationship with him is his dream come true. Jesus said in verse 24, Father, I desire. Just think about those three words for a second. Father, I desire. These are not light words. These are not just a a nice little phrase. But these words are deep and burning. Jesus was sweating blood when he was praying this to the Father. Father, I desire. The desire of God for us is so intense that the human body didn't even know what to do with it. Couldn't even handle it. And now he says, come up here. Come up here. I prepared a table for you. Come up here. Come up here. I've made a way for you. Come up here. I've opened the door. Come up here. My arms are open wide. Come up here. My heart is open. It's willing. It's loving. Come up here. My love is passionate and tender. Come up here. My love is unending. Come up here. My mercy endures forever. Come up here. My grace abounds where sin is. Come up here. I have forgiven you. I've washed you. I've cleansed you. Come up here. I've redeemed you by the blood of the lamb. Come up here. That's the cry of God in this awakening that we're experiencing. This isn't just for us to have a nice experience, just to have more church services and just to have... And there's, there's tremendous, tremendous pleasures in loving God, but this isn't just about the pleasures that, so we can personally experience more pleasure in the presence of God. This is about us rising up to a higher place. It's about us experiencing a greater dimension of His glory and taking it to a lost and dying world. Jesus is going up the mountain and He's saying, Peter, James, and John, Those who are closest to me will see the greatest manifestation of my glory. I will reveal my secrets to those who are closest to me. And when we see that glory, when we see the manifestation of who he is, then he turns to us and says, bring that to someone else. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's go back to verse 23. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Did someone dare to say that word perfect? I had two people. (laughs) Say that again. Say perfect. Perfect. Hmm. Hallelujah. We're going we're gonna to go into that a little bit more in a minute. Hallelujah. That may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I said this a few nights ago, but I want to say it again because it's so powerful. God loves you to the same intensity and degree that God loves himself. That's amazing. Did you know God loves God? It's like, man, he's conceited. No, he's holy. God loves God. Jesus said in another passage, he said, Father, just as you have loved me, I have also loved them. Hmm. And then now he says, Father, you have also loved them to the same degree that you have loved me. So we got, we got both of them love us. Hallelujah. 
and the Holy Spirit. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me or who you gave me may be with me where I am. That they may behold the glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus declares, and what an interesting last statement. Said, For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Why did he say that? Because he said, Father, I know you're going to grant this desire of mine because of your love for me. I remember... Probably, it's about three and a half years ago now. I was, it was, I believe it was a Tuesday night. It was close to the end of the year, close to Christmas. And I was just getting ready to leave, to come to the church for band rehearsal. And I got a call from my mom. She said, you're never going to believe what was left on the receptionist desk with your name on it. I said, oh, does someone leave like a letter or something? That's nice. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's kind of, that's, that was where my expectations were at at that moment. She said, no, somebody anonymous, on, anonymously has just given you and your brother brand new MacBook Pros. <laughs> now, what was more incredible is that there was one thing, because I've been praying for that, there was one specific upgrade. I said, I wanted a bigger hard drive. There was one specific upgrade above just the base model that I wanted, and that computer had it. Yeah, give the Lord a hand of praise. He's so good. But I was, as I was driving to the church, pretty happy, as you might imagine, Praise God. Amen. People sometimes have an issue with Apple. I say, hey, God gave me an Apple product, so that means he's okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> gave me two, actually. He gave me an iPad, too, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. That was, that was, was it? I don't remember. It was, it was afterwards. Praise God. But as I was driving to the church, I remember just just thanking the Lord, and he spoke to me, and he said, Son, I did this for you because I love you. He said, I just wanted to show you how much I love you. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That God will grant us the desires of our heart out of his love for us. Hallelujah. 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 Isaiah 45, verse 19. This is powerful. The Lord says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, and I declare things that are right. God says, I have not called you to seek me in vain. I've called you to seek me Because it's right, and I intend to show you great and awesome things. Let's go to the Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. I'm going to try and go through this quickly. I just want to expound a little bit more on the relationship that God desires in this time. Beginning with verse 7. This is the the Shunammite woman saying to her beloved. It's the the typology of Jesus and the church. It says, tell me, O you you who I love, where you feed your flock where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? She says, it's kind of interesting here that, that what's going on because she says, I want to be, be with him. 
But instead of demanding that he, instead of asking that he stop his business and come to where I am, I say, show me where you are. Show me where you are. I want to be with you are, and I want to be in the middle of what you're doing. I want to be, in, because put it in your spirit, when we truly love God, we love to be in the middle of what he's doing. We love to be in the middle of all the activity and all the things that he's doing in the work of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And it's interesting here, she said, where you feed your flock and where you make it rest at noon. She understood the shepherding heart of her beloved. She understood that he was one that was going to be generous in feeding and generous in rest. One who is not causing them to just work and toil or not one who is just neglecting them, but one who cared and loved his flock. Just as Christ cares for and nourishes the church. Moving on to verse 8. He responds. says, if you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. Notice how affectionate the answer is. God is quick to answer prayers like this. The believing soul is beautiful to God. He says, O oh, fairest among women. The believing soul is beautiful to God. It is the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. I'm going to read you a couple verses real quickly that kind of expounds on this. God is calling us. He said, you want to find out where I am. Look at the footsteps of those who have walked before you. Proverbs 2.20. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. Hebrews 6, 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run. Look to those who have run the race before you, those who have kept the faith, those who have been faithful till the end, those who have inherited the promises and follow in those footsteps and you will find your beloved. You will find where he is. You don't have to... You don't have to try and run the race on your own. You don't have to try and find the way on your own. But God has left a path. God has left a path. He hasn't just given us access to the destination, but he's given us a roadmap. Hallelujah. He's given us a roadmap. That's why it's such a tragedy that so often that we are so quick to just throw aside authority and to just throw aside, well, they did this and so I don't like them and they did this so I don't like them. So, but no, but did they love God? Did they love God? Because if they love God, if they ran after God, there's got to be something that they knew that you need. The enemy wants so often, he wants to turn us away from those who have ran before. He wants to devalue the previous moves of God. He wants to devalue, say, oh, well, they're just old. I just, I can't tap into that. They're old school. Well, humble yourself and you'll tap into it because it's the anointing. It's the anointing. The anointing doesn't age. It doesn't change because it's God. He said, I stay the same. I never change. Now, does it have different appearances because of people's personalities? Absolutely. But God, I pray that we're hungry enough that we can look past personality to see the Jesus inside someone. And we do not justify sin for a moment, but if God is so quick to forgive us, why can't we be so quick to forgive others? Ha, ha, hey. I remember a couple years ago in the church, Pastor Steve shared about time years and years and years ago but he was struggling in an area and he shared about it a couple ladies and, and he's, he's like i've been free for over 10 years a couple a couple people in the church was like oh man we can't come to this church and i just say he who has never sinned among you be the first to cast a stone hallelujah all right let's move on before i i get stoned Song of Solomon 1, verse 9. Who, ha, 
I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now, I, I like that, that that's compared. It's not like I made a comparison. Like, oh, you remind me of horses. <laughs> Just, no. The message, it's kind of funny to think about. But the message, the message that he's bringing here, he says, in your weakness, I'm made strong. When he's saying, I've compared you, he's, and, and I, I really believe this. I read this in the Matthew Henry commentary today, but he's saying, what I believe God is saying here is, I've ordained strength and boldness to you, to those who have come close to me. I give strength and boldness. God doesn't just, he's not just willing to forgive and overlook our weakness, but he's also desiring to empower it, to give us strength. Verse 10. Now, this is the part where it kind of seems a little weird, but it's not, trust me. It says, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. And I want to read you this quote. This is from the Matthew Henry Commentary. I believe this is very powerful. The ordinances of Christ are the ornaments of the church. The graces, gifts, and comforts of the Spirit are the adorning of every believing soul and beautify it. These render it in the sight of God of great price. The ornaments of the saints are many, but all orderly d disposed in rows and chains in which there is a mutual connection with the dependence upon each other. The beauty is not from anything in themselves. Someone say, it's not about me. Not from the neck or from the cheeks, but from ornaments with which they are set of. Our beauty is not dependent upon who we are, it's who he is. That's what he's saying here. Saying, you are beautiful because of what I have done in you and what I have done through you. Your value and your worth is not based upon yesterday. But it's based upon what I say you are. Amen? Hmm. If I could get the worship team. I want to read you a couple more verses. Ezekiel 16, verse 14. Remember what we talked about being perfect? Just kind of mentioned it. This is powerful. Ezekiel 16, 14. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord. We are made perfect in him. And so he says, come up here. Come up here, and I'll make you perfect. Come up here to where I am. You say, well, what about this thing and this thing going on? Say, oh, no, no, when you're at 10,000 feet, those little cars driving around just don't look very big. Those little things, God says, look at it through my eyes. Do you see what I see? You see ashes, but I see beauty. You see darkness, but I say, you're lovely. You see weakness, but I see strength. You see weak love, but I see genuine love. And he just says, come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Let's stand. One more verse. Psalm 24, beginning with verse 3. We know this very well. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. God is not requiring us to reach some high level of hyper-spirituality or perfection before he's willing to accept us in. But rather he says, wash your hands. And wash your heart with the, with the washing of the water of the word. In fact, I'll help you do it. Just say yes. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. There is such an incredible work that God is doing here at the upper room. And you will get the most out of it. 
Because put it in your spirit. God is not just doing this for you. He's doing it for this region. He's doing it for the world. He's doing it for himself. And so God has trusted us as stewards of his anointing and of an awakening manifestation of that spirit. And the way that we can be the best stewards of what God has is to answer that call. Come up here. Come up here. To not just visit, but to live in that place. Say, well, I don't know how to do that. He'll teach you. We may not enjoy the process, but God does. He enjoys the process every step of the way. Hallelujah. And he says, don't worry, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. It's by my spirit. But if that, if you want to answer that call, you say, you know, I, that registers with me, I feel that call. I want to, I want to answer that to, a, to just make a commitment before God. Say, God, help me. I want to come up here. I want to answer that call. If that's you, I want you to, I want you to come up here.